Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. In, nice case, to in case everyone does not recognize the iconic face that we're looking at right now, um, my guest today is Sarah Lamb, who is known around the globe for spinning, weaving, knitting, your color work. Um, you have so much to offer so many people, and I have been so fortunate to be able to be one of your students to learn from you and uh hear a oh, lot thank first. you yeah i'm i'm thank so you. excited to have you that's very nice of you to say you have been spinning for such a long time do you know when you started right well, it was 1977 i was a weaver and um, I couldn't afford much yarn. My husband at the time was a baker, so he'd bring home that bakery string that you tie up the pink boxes with, and I'd weave with that. And a neighbor had sheep, and I watched them shear the sheep, and I thought, well, I could, do, I could use that stuff. I could learn how to spin, and of course it would be, quote, cheap. And um, <laughs> <laughs> like everyone thinks. So at any rate, I, I found a spinning wheel at the time um, and uh, then I had to try to find a class there were classes it was the 70s so you know back to the back to the uh, land classes and eventually I found a teacher a woman named Marcia Stone who um, wove um, sort of Navajo rugs but contemporary she was uh, not a Navajo weaver but she wove in that style and then my second teacher was Gloria Spencer who was also a rug weaver and so from the very beginning, I was a weaver and they were weavers and I wanted to use the yarn for weaving. And I never got the message that you can't use hand spun for weaving or that you can't use it for work. You know, I just didn't get that message because I had the quote wrong teachers. So um, I started spinning for weaving right away. Well, wasn't that, much of a knitter. That's fantastic. And you know, yeah. I think that, you know, going back, you can look at the history and it's, you know, anybody who says you shouldn't use hand spun for weaving is kind of well, false. Nice. <laughs> nice. But at the time, in the 70s, a lot of people were spinning sort of um, fat yarns and, and bumpy yarns and, you know, just uh, more oriented towards it would, you could look at it and say it would be knitting yarn rather than weaving yarn. So. Right, right. I just... I go back to thinking of all those sails that got sailors right. across oceans, you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. The, or all the clothes we wore, and right. you know, the the eight hundred thread count sheets in the Egyptian right. tombs. Right. Yeah, they they were not made. Yeah, at a factory. No, <laughs> no they were made with spindles, not even wheels. When I think about you, I think garments i think spinning to weave weaving to make garments right um one of my questions really goes to your planning process mm -hmm. right well that's interesting because um it just occurred to me a few years ago that um, my process is when i'm starting to weave something i don't know or haven't woven before um, i'll use cotton i use commercial cotton and weave prototypes and um, prototypes turn into a series because you'll weave one and you know which mistakes you've made or what you'd like to do differently. And then after no, I get wait. a couple of- you're, you're saying sample? Well, yeah, well, there's that. Yes. <laughs> so for years, um, my, my uh, first, we'll say the kimonos. Let's start with that because I've done those for 40 years. And the first one that I purchased was a, um, an indigo ecot kimono from Japan. Uh, there was a woman who used to sell uh, indigo, or rather Japanese fabrics at the uh, Berkeley flea market in the 70s. You used to be able to buy a bale of Japanese fabrics and then she'd sell them at the flea market. So I bought this indigo kimono and uh, wore it a lot and it started to wear out. You know, these were used clothing, was used clothing to begin with. So it started to wear out and I thought, well, I'm a weaver, I could make this. So I made the first one and I basically just copied that garment. It had you know, fabric that was about 12 inches wide and it was resist dyed. So I resist dyed some cotton and um, sewed it all together and it was a success. 
there were things I learned. Um, I wanted, my fabric was heavier than the Japanese fabric. Um, I did, um, I fit it to myself instead of the, the Japanese piece that I had purchased was a little bit larger. So I tried a, a second one and a third one and you know, 10 years later I was still making them. They fit me nicely and I have rather square shoulders. So a, a garment like that hangs off of me nicely. And um, it was a great sort of um, canvas to play with different kinds of colors, different yarns. And I was also learning to dye. So I was dyeing the yarns in different ways and putting it all together. I was, I'm fortunate enough to be in California where we had uh, the Conference of Northern California Hand Weavers every year. So I would get feedback. I'd enter these things in the show and people would say, you know, um, I actually, my, some of my garments, not the kimonos, but my first garment that I ever entered, I didn't realize there was judging. And the judging sheet came back saying that my piece was <clears throat> very, very creative, but not very good craftsmanship. And so I thought, well, okay, I can work on that. So I worked on the craftsmanship next year, literally different judge, same show, but you know, the different, they had a different judge that year said my piece was very good craftsmanship, but not very creative. So aha, you have to put both of those two things together. So um, I think the critiques that we get at shows like that, um, you know, some people might find them a um, stopping point, but for me, they were encouraging. It was like, this is what you have to work on. And I began to think of it as, um, as if I was going to school. If I were going to school, I would have assignments and I'd have to finish them and turn them in. And then they would get, I would get feedback and um, I would then make a better assignment. And you know, essentially as sort of autodidact, which is what we are, we're teaching ourselves how to do all this. Um, we need those, uh, that feedback and um, you build on what you've done before. So I just kept going making kimonos. Eventually I got out of cotton and started making them in silk, commercial silk. And then um, probably, oh, let's see, it was 97, I think. Um, so I'd been making them for, for at least 15 years before I made my first hand spun one. And by then, you know, I'd been spinning for quite a while, and, well, 20 years. And I thought, well, I can do this. And so I was going to make my masterpiece. I spun a lot of silk and I um, dyed it all up and I put the fabric on the loom. I knew exactly how to make this kimono. And I got it off the loom and sewed it together. And it's okay, but it's not spectacular. So then I had to make another hand spun silk one and another hand spun silk one. And by, you know, the 10th one or so, I, I think I really got it. So it just takes a while to get all the details and all the elements pulled together. And I think, you know, to make one set of placemats and, and never make another, you don't know how good you could possibly be. Right. So that's, that's one of the, you know, um, things I keep telling people. You'll find something that you want to make again and again. And it's not a big problem having 50 kimonos hanging in my closet. How do you plan, like, let's say you were going to plan your next kimono. Right. What, does, what does that look like? What does that planning process look like? I mean, I just, I read something, I think, on one of your blogs. Oh, no, no. I, oh, I take that back. It was in one of the books, either no. Spin to Wee <laughs> or The Practical Guide to Spinning Silk. Um, you know, you were talking um, in one of these uh, about how you started out by spinning 22 ounces of silk. You know, and I don't remember which project that was for. But oh, right. I'm just kind of trying to figure out, you know, and, and I think it was one of the kimonos possibly. And you said that you, um, it might have been, it, uh, it might have been this one. So that's yeah, the uh, Tessa. Come the on. Tessa one, but it, it might have been this one. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, and and you just you you talk about like, well, I started by spinning. You know, you spin and then you die and then you're weaving. Like there's this whole 
layer of process that right. you know has to be somewhere here first like where what does that look like well let's see um about four years ago i was talking to a group of people about uh, garment making and um, i mentioned the folkwear turkish coat pattern that i purchased when i first learned to weave so in the early 70s and i hadn't ever made it up and everybody said, well, you know, you had the thing for 25 years, 35, 40 years, might as well make it up or else get rid of the, the pattern. So I got out that pattern and laid it out and measured all the pieces and figured out how much fabric I'd need to make that. And just like the kimonos, I started with commercial cotton on that and made um, a warp that was 11 inches wide and I think nine or 10 yards long because the, the Turkish coat is panels. So it doesn't have to be real wide fabric. And so then I sewed that up according to the directions and the, the um, pattern. And it was insane. It was, um, uh, the, I know they reverse engineered when they first did these patterns, they, they had a garment, they'd measured out and then they figured out how, how to sew it together. But they sewed it together in a way I never would. They took pieces and, and quilted them together, and then they sewed all these quilted pieces together, and there was all kinds of overlapping of seams. Anyway, I knew I could make it better, so I made another one out of silk the next time. Now I knew how much fabric to make, how wide the fabric needed to be, you know, and, and in this particular coat, um, there's a lining and then the, the outer coat, so you have to weave, you don't have to weave. I wove um, a different fabric for the outer coat and a different fabric for the lining. And then the second one came together really well. So then I decided to do a hand spun one and that one I'm still working on, but um, you've, I've already got essentially how much fabric I need. So I spin um, a bobbin of yarn, two bobbins and ply them together because I almost always use plied yarn. And then I run one of those warps and see how far that two bobbins will go and, how, and then I figure out how many bobbins I will need. So for the recent kimono, I'm now doing the lining. Um, I did two bobbins on my um, high speed bobbins and then plied them together. And then once I ran that warp, uh, it's just you know part of the warp and eventually, I knew I needed to spin eight more bobbins and ply those together for this. And this is just for the band for the front of the coat. So now I know I can sit down and just spin eight bobbins for uh, this stuff and ply it all together and I'll have enough for the band. So for each portion of that garment, that's how I figure out how much to spin. Um, for the kimono, um, I'll spin, run a couple bobbins and um, make a warp, paint that or dye that and then figure out how many more I need for the, the width of the fabric. And I'm doing plain weave, so I don't have a specific number I'm going to need for a structure of some kind. And I'm also, um, I'll vary the width in a kimono. It might be 14 inches wide fabric or 15 inches wide. So, you know, I'll run it and sometimes that's, I've run out of yarn and that determines that it's gonna be 14 and, you know, a half inches wide instead of the 15 I planned. That's a variable in the kinds of garments that I make. And certainly that would be variable in a cut and sew. And the Turkish coat is cut and sew. There's, there's panels, but the, the pieces that you cut have an angle to them. So the several pieces will fit on, on one panel. So curious. Anyway, so that's kind of the planning process. Start with the cheap, yes. So you were talking about running some warps and mm -hmm. um, I know that, I mean, I weave on a shaft loom and I also weave on a rigid huddle loom. Right. So when you are doing that, running a warp, like figuring that out, um, how are you doing that? And what are you weaving on? Ah, uh, so two things. I warp front to back to begin with and I'm not doing sectional. So, you know, I can run a bunch of warps and, and gather them all together and then I design in the reed. Most of my fabrics are pretty narrow. And for, say, the Turkish coat, um, I'm weaving 11 inches wide. So, you know, I just get that through the reed and through the heddles and 
then um, you know, weave that off. And I for the Turkish coat, I need seven fabrics. I need the outside has two or three fabrics, and then there's a band, and then the lining has two or three fabrics, and there's a band on that too. So I'm just weaving fabric after fabric, and um, and the most recent one, I did run out of fabric in the lining, so I patched it. Um, you can decide to do that if you want, and you know I I chose to do that, but. Um, the most recent one is the hand spun one that I'm working on and that engendered the idea for two more hand spun ones. So I'm working on two others at the same time. I mean, I can't stop. Okay. Once you get the idea, you have to keep going. So do you have <laughs> anything to show us right now? Of Not like show you. Can you, can you Ooh, okay. flash us yes. do a little flash okay. show? Here's the, here's the other fun thing. So a friend, a weaver friend died five, five, six years ago. And as we do, we cleaned out her studio and had a big studio sale. And there was this big basket of yarn that just got overlooked over and over again. And it was kind of funky yarn. She learned to spin about the same time I did. She used to work at Straw and Gold and um, she was a longtime spinner and weaver. And this was probably an early yarn from like the 70s. And in the basket was a little pattern. It cost a dollar, so you know when it was purchased, and a little swatch of the yarns. And so, you know, this funky yarn was just sitting there. Nobody wanted to buy it. So I took it home. And because we're now quarantined at home, um, my first effort when in March or April, ever was to clean out the studio and I came across this basket of yarn and I said you know I'm just gonna make something of this so I got out all her yarns and they were really funky I mean they were different sizes different twists and you know they were pretty big and I dyed them all and then I put this scarf on the, the loom and just wove with it and I wanted to weave all the um, yarn up so I put a little more to your right uh, over to my right. Okay. There you go. Thank you. So I put all the um, little extra bits in as inlay and I did a little bit of twill and I just threw it all together and it was great fun. I used up all her yarn and you know made a, a thing. Um, it's a shawl or scarf or something and you know it's now no longer just a sad little basket of yarn but I had so much fun sticking in little bits and changing twill and blah, blah, blah. So I had this other yarn that I had um, purchased. Actually, no, this was a uh, hand spun. I purchased some fiber from a new mill nearby. It's actually an older mill that somebody purchased and changed the name. It's called Valley Oak Mill and spun it up and then made myself a shawl similar to the one that I'd made with Barbara's yarn with all these little, you know, inlays and um, bits of sumac going across it. And they're just so much fun. So then I spun up some really soft yarn, some Polworth silk and did another one. Now this is my favorite thing that I have made in years. It's just so much fun and I love this thing and it's soft. The weft is silk and it changes all the time and it's fun to spin, it's fun to weave. There was nothing unfun about it and I think it's gorgeous. Now, I'm kind of, you know, uh, 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 as somebody said, bold color person, but man, I love doing this. And it was the kind of weaving that takes a little bit more time than just throwing the shuttle, you know, you have to kind of think, okay, does that look good there? Or does that look good? Shall I change the color now? And, you know, I had more fun than a barrel of monkeys. I've made six of these at this point. And who knew at the beginning that this little sad basket of yarn would spark all of this stuff. That's exactly what it did. So there you go. That's how a series starts and so, uh you know how it keeps going so you said six you've made six of i've those? made six of those plus a piece of garment fabric that i had on the loom it was uh raw silk i also did some of that inlay and some of the sumac and um i took the fabric off the loom 
oh, it's around here someplace, but I can't actually reach it. And um, now when I sew the garment together, I get to decide where all of that stuff falls on the garment and whether the inlay has those little tails out or those little tails in. I mean, it's way too much fun. And it's just plain women. You know, it's nothing fancy. But um, it's because I think we have time. I'm not interrupted. I don't get in the, on a plane and go someplace. I'm here and I just have, might as well, because I have plenty of time. So most fun I've had in years and my literal favorite thing I've made for years. That's awesome. So um, is that the series that is the, like the next that you're working on right now? Um, you know, I think it, it's, uh, between the Turkish coats, which this one, the one I'm working on right now is the, the Turkish coat is the pole where silk is the outside and then silk is the lining. And, but the next one that I've already woven the outside is a wool mohair. And the wool mohair was yarn that I just, I mean, I bought it for a knotted pile and I was spinning it and it was just so much fun to spin because, you know, wool and mohair, this, this is like Romney wool or something. It spins just like butter. And so I spun it all up and then I made a piece of fabric. And when I got it off the fabric, uh, the, off the loom, it was one of those fabrics that I would uh, recognize in my childhood. They, we wore uh, more rustic and woolen fabrics. And I don't know if you remember, old cars used to have mohair um, yeah. upholstery. Yep. And it, it felt like that. And so I knew A, it needed a lining. And in this case, it probably needs an inner lining just to make it wearable. And because this coat has a band around the neck, I made that out of um, Blueface Lester and silk instead of the wool mohair. And as a spinner, we can do that. We can pick any kind of wool we want and or silk and make different, you know, components of the garment out of different fabrics and put it all together. So that's the next one. And then as I was weaving that one, I thought, well, that should have hand spun cotton lining. So I have to spin all the cotton lining and, and I'm gonna dye that blue, so sort of indigo, but I'm not sure I'll use indigo. And then I thought, well, the next one should be hand spun cotton on the outside and silk lining on the inside. And so I have to do all that spinning and you know, we, all, we have a year, so maybe I'll get them done. Right. But oh, that's yeah. essentially how a series happens. It just, one thing leads to another. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I'm always amazed. Every time that I look at one of your books, I just can't help thinking about the time and the effort and the amount of spinning that goes into it. Um, you know, yeah. the, but the, other, the, other, the other question that I know people ask me is that you spin all this yarn and then how could you cut the fabric? But I want to ask you, so you spin yarn, you weave the fabric, you cut the fabric to make your garments. How, well, how, how do you feel about cut pile? <laughs> <laughs> all of it, you know, um, you have to, once I spin the yarn, I kind of think of it as yarn. And since I was a weaver first, um, I, that part of it isn't a problem. To put it on the loom and cut it, and cut it when it gets off the loom, it's not a problem to me. It's not all that precious. You can spin more. And, you know, <laughs> I, you do have a lot more. I mean, I spin every day. So I you spin in the mornings. And it tends to pile up. And that makes it less precious. If you're just making one thing, then yes, it's hard. But if you've got the next one to get to, you know, let's get through this one and get to the next one because, you know, you have another idea and you have to keep going. So it's like, um, I don't know, there's, um, uh, it, it, it's, making is the fun part, not having the thing. And um, so, it, the making part, I just want to keep at it. And, you know, once that kimono's done, I'm, I'm moved on to the next one. So, or Turkish coat or whatever. I can't even wear all these things. I have to give them away because there's, I mean, how many coats do you need? 
<laughs> well, I don't know. With the, the policies with airline travel, I've often said that pretty soon we're just going to be wearing a week's worth of clothes on the, <laughs> <laughs> onto the plane yeah. instead of trying to <laughs> pack a bag. It's so great just to see your face, especially in this time. And it is nice to have uh, friendly faces on the, on the computer, the uh, faces that we know. I know. I'm so happy that you were able to take the time for us. And um, we look forward to seeing what you have to do next. If anyone is interested and not already following Sarah on Instagram, um, she's at lamb spin three four three two again that's lamb spin three four three two and right. you can keep up with all of her progress on all of the new and fun projects that she's working on always thank an inspiration you. thank you so thank much you. sarah <laughs>